Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Rocky Lemus. I'm the Extension 4 Special at Mississippi State. I'm going to be in charge of the uh, uh, session today. Um, for the speakers, uh, you have 17 minutes. When you have four minutes left, I'm going to stand up so, so you can start wrapping it up. We're going to keep it on time, and also we want to make sure that you have uh, time for a couple of questions in there. Okay? No, I'm looking at Josh. Okay, uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Joshua White. Uh, Do Dr. White is actually the uh, Forge Variety ma uh, Testing Manager at Mississippi State. He does a lot of uh, variety testing with both cool season and warm season throughout the state, and he has a lot of experience in this field, so I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about his topic. Rocky, do I have to stand here, or yeah. can I stand oh, over there? Oh, you can pick it out if you, if you want to. You can, you can pick the microphone if you want okay. to. Okay. I bet they can hear me. Can you all hear me now? No? Okay. All right. I'm left-handed, so I'm going to stand over here. Um, so annual ryegrass is arguably, for, I'm sure there's plenty of people in the southeast here, the most important cool season forage crop we have. Um, in Mississippi and, and really the, the southeast. Uh, I mean, our stalkers are raised off of it. Um, it's great for cow and calf, but uh, other than Bermuda and Bahia, it, it definitely is basically our staple. Um, so obviously we have a lot of variety testing that goes on. Um, it's probably our single most uh, uh, proliferate as far as how many varieties we get in every year uh, that, that, that we actually test. Um, so, but there is a lot of, when we try to talk to producers about ryegrass, and what variety or what cultivar they need to, to select. Um, a lot of questions be, uh, get brought up because a lot of times it's about ploidy, um, but there's also maturity classes of ryegrass and just how you how you seeding that ryegrass. So there's a lot more questions um, to ask. And so what I try to do is kind of summarize three different studies that we've actually uh, that that we've done or or, or drawn data from or draw data from the variety testing, um, uh, yeah, from the from the variety testing. And basically to look at how ryegrass performs uh, over, over time. So it is high quality pasture uh, basically from December to May uh, for the most part. So that's why our producers uh, use it. December, probably not so much in the northern part of the state, but as we move into uh, the southern part of the state, you definitely get in there by December. Um, keep in mind also that with ryegrass, six, about 60% of over half of it is actually overseeded into a warm season perennial. So so a mixture of or in pure stands of Bermuda and Bahia. So unfortunately, and I'll talk about that in a minute, most of our ryegrass variety trials are all just conventionally planted. So it doesn't quite translate. And we did a little study to kind of show that. Uh, most of the newer cultivars that are out there um, in the last, maybe released in the last five to 10 years are all gonna be mid to late maturities. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about maturities. They really play a big role, probably more so than ploidy. Uh, most producers, if you would ask them, um, every producer I've ever asked about when they actually want that forage, that ryegrass yield, they're going to tell me as early as possible, um, not necessarily as late as possible. They want to get off some of that hay. Um, generally, we had, they have plenty of forage by the time we get into April and May, or, or a March and April. Um, so we're basically dividing up, and we'll look at both of these uh, ploidy. So we have basically a tetraploid and diploid um, ryegrasses. When you get into how seed companies kind of advertise them, they're either uh, a tetraploid or a diploid is how they basically advertise. But we don't really talk much about maturities, but we're basically into three different groups, um, early, mid, or really four groups, um, mid, mid to late, or even late maturing uh, cultivars. And so that's the best way to really try to uh, describe them, um, especially when we're talking about when that yield's going to be um, available. So real quick, looking at just the effect of maturity, especially in our conventional versus our overseeded systems. We did a little study 
a few years back where we had some seed companies enter um, some, some, some varieties, and we looked at the conventional versus overseeded. Now, obviously, most of y'all that know that you, when you overseed in a perennial sod, you basically lose about a month of your cool season grass growth because it takes that long. It, it generally germinates, but it takes that long to get going um, and overcome that perennial sod uh, to some degree. Um, and so, but we also have, and I'll show you in a minute, we have issues on the back end too, right? Whenever bahia grass is starting to green up, if we have some of our later maturity ryegrasses, what we end up seeing is, is some of these ryegrasses generally start to hinder with, with our bahia grass. So uh, what we have here was just a quick study. We looked at, uh, it's kind of hard to find a lot of early maturing varieties out there. They're, they're usually older uh, varieties, because like I said, most of them are mid to late that are on the market. Um, but Pfizer is extremely early. And you can see that kind of, that's indicative with, with its yield there. So in the conventional plots, we still saw, you know, that was way more, almost double um, some of the yield because it was one of those by the time you get into March or, or actually April, you start seeing seed heads already. So it was extremely early, extremely, it was kind of hard to find actually. Um, but, but we did get it in there and it's, you see the result of an early maturing um, diploid. Uh, there and now some of the other early maturings didn't do quite as well. Um, they were kind of on par with some of your mids to late. But the important part of this was looking at I was trying to look at maturity and how it affected our our ryegrass yield. But we also wanted to look on the back end on what it did to our bahia grass decrease. So you got your control plot, which is going to be your pure uh, bahia grass that we just didn't overseed. And when we har when it was ready to harvest, we harvested everything else. Um, so we had a pretty good decline when you look at some of your late maturing. Um, on the right, end, right hand side of that uh, graph, your, your late maturing uh, ryegrasses, um, you start seeing we, we affected the yield quite a bit, okay? And so if you're a producer, I mean, that, that's quite a bit of, of, or you have to wait until you actually get that. So it, it affected bahia grass, and, and it would have been the same thing or probably worse with Bermuda grass. Um, but you look in the ones that are circled in blue, the, again, those are our early maturing varieties, and they tend to be on that side of the spectrum. So Generally, we saw less of, a, of an effect with those uh, varieties. But again, it wasn't always about maturity. Um, so it, it, it's hard to put them in that class and say, if you do an early maturing, you're going to not affect your bahia grass near as much. So, um, but we did see a little bit of a trend uh, that basically suggested that. Uh, so yield improvement, and this was, we looked at a 30-year trial um, where we, not, we, we mined data from the variety testing just to see uh, basically what our diploids and tetraploids were doing over longer periods of time. And basically, uh, you diploids, I mean, we, with genetic, new genetic material out there, uh, we basically have increased in yield. Um, so, so over from 85 to 2015, we really saw that, I mean, thanks to our new genetic material, we have increased um, uh, uh, our yields uh, for the most part. And the same thing with tetraploids, so about the, about the same rate, even though most of our new varieties are really more or less tetraploids for the most part. Uh, we do see that either way, they both have increased um, over time. So last, last little experiment, last study we kind of uh, we, we put together was looking at, uh, so every year we have about 30 to 50 cultivars that we actually test. About 30% of them are experimentals uh, from the seed companies. So we, we have quite a few uh, to, to, to really to select from. Um, and actually we've started doing more for seed companies doing private uh, screening trials. And so that's been uh, pretty advantageous, I think, to actually selecting varieties that, get, that actually get selected and chosen um, in the Southeast uh, for later use. Uh, so basically, how our harvests usually end up is we usually get one in December, and if you're in the South Mississippi, and then we get three. So generally, three to four harvests is generally what we go after um, every year. And those, those mid or March and April, and our late harvest is going to be end of April to early May. So that's kind of how those get divided up for this, for this next uh, little group of data. Um, so we selected, I did it for 11 years instead of the longer time period because that's how many years I've been doing this. So I know it was uh, managed kind of uh, similar from year to year. But most trials look at, when we look at long-term ryegrass studies, we're looking at total seasonal yield um, rather than harvest yield. So I really wanted to take all that raw data and actually look at harvest performance. Um, so I looked at 17 cultivars because Again, when you're relying on seed companies, uh, we don't have, we don't get the same cultivar every year. So these 17 were in there most of the time um, for that 11 year period. And we ended up selecting 10 tetraploids and seven diploids uh, for that. 
And we looked at the far south uh, along the coast, which is Poplarville uh, location, and also in Starkville, which is going to be more north, uh, north central um, in the state. So that's what it ended up uh, working out. So we had, again, all those diploids, and those were the ones that were basically in there. So varieties, I would say most of our producers could probably get any one of those varieties um, pretty easily. So uh, that, this was going to help our producers out and basically look at how many diploids and tetraploids we, we have there. Um, so basically, when it, and just to start out, what happened was year was always in effect. And anybody that's grown, done variety trials know that year plays a huge role. Um, this year was no exception to that. Uh, this was the first year we actually saw ryegrass get burnt off completely. So year, um, and it, it affected maturity as well uh, on, on some of those. Those early maturings really took off. Uh, Ploidy level had a limited effect on yield. Uh, when I, and this is, goes along with some of the other studies that we did when we've looked at long-term um, uh, effect of ploidy levels. We don't really see a huge difference in our tetraploids and diploids. Uh, generally speaking, we saw a slight effect with diploids. We're, we're basically greater in the north uh, part of the state. But as we move south, tetraploid and diploids were equal. Um, you would think it would be that tetraploids, uh, most of their claim is that they're doing better in the south, but that's just not necessarily true. Um, Harvest yield was more dynamic um, than total seasonal yield, so we kind of stuck with the rest of my grass from kind of just sticking and looking at harvest yield. Because really, when you look at total seasonal yield, you're really looking at just, but all your ryegrass basically breaks into three different groups. Uh, so for the most part, our producers, and they're not that different, so our producers really are more, more concerned with, with harvest yield. Uh, so generally, percent of the total, um, we don't see a huge difference on where a tetraploid or diploid actually put. Uh, that yield. You see it's pretty similar in South Mississippi um, and North Mississippi was pretty similar except for our tetraploids tend to produce more of their yield a little bit later compared to the diploids. Uh, so our early, oh wait, Rocky, you deleted one of my <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks. You just thought ahead. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> So there was a December and January one up there, but it's no longer there. Um, so we'll move into March. Uh, <coughs> apparently that wasn't, wasn't very important. But uh, so in March, uh, you have, um, again, we, we don't see huge differences in Starkville. We see more differences when we move south. And you can see these are going to be mid to late that attain and, and Big Boss. But you still see a two to 200 to 300 pound um, difference in our cultivars. And you really see those big and that, that adds up, so it doesn't seem like much when you look at them in plot trials, but when you have a producer, that means they could have another 15, 20 days of grazing, depending on, on their stocking rate, um, and they can get out of, out of feeding hay a little bit early. So, uh, but again, so you do have a little bit of a difference, and again, those are going to be your mid to late uh, varieties. Um, we don't see as much, it's not very dynamic in Starkville. The graph that was not there in December, January, what we saw was Starkville was, was you did see a big difference in Starkville and what you saw because we're going to be a lot cooler in Starkville, we got heavier soils, um, cooler soils, was actually Lone Star was one that did really, really well. It stood out um, and it was about a two to three hundred pound difference uh, than the nearest variety uh, in Starkville and we, we can see that. We can usually go out there and tell which plot is, is Lone Star and, it, and it's Lone Star is an older variety as well. but. Um, but it's a diploid and it's going to be a, more of a mid, uh, it's not a mid to late, it's more like a mid uh, maturity uh, cultivar. So as you move into April, this is where things start getting a little, this is where we get most of our April and May is really where we see a lot of our, our yield. And if you look at, if we go to our, um, this side of the graph, we're going to see, again, on these, uh, all your diploids are all the way up to uh, are the first seven, and then we have our other ones are going to be our tetraploids. Um, if you see Nelson Prime, Tim Tebow, and Tetrastar, they're, they're doing pretty dang good um, in Poplarville. But again, we start seeing a 300 to 1,000 pound difference in, between some of our, uh, pretty con uh, our, our varieties that are pretty consistently in the trial. But again, those are all tetraploids, but we still have some of our diploids do about, uh, do, do pretty similar as well. Pline A and Freya, you're gonna see, um, they're, doing, they're doing similar with, with some of those uh, late maturing uh, uh, Tetraploid. So really, it's about where we class them as far as maturity status is what we, what we really saw here. Uh, and the last one, again, we're looking at quite a bit of, of yield um, in May. This is probably going to be more of most of the time this fourth harvest was in our, our late April, early May uh, arena. 
Um, again, a two to 300 pound um, difference, but everything starts to level out a little bit. Uh, you do see some with Tim, De Tim Tebow did, did, does extremely well over time. Uh, so it, it really liked that, those late, late season type of harvest. So um, with that being said, really what you, it's, it's hard to even place a maturity status and say they're gonna do a certain, they're gonna perform a certain way. It really is just genetic. That they're, they're more unique than we think they are. Um, but it is, I think, very important when we're talking about producers, uh, about when they actually need that harvest yield is really start to look at harvest data rather than total seasonal yield. I don't know what my time is, Ron, so. Okay. Any questions for Dr. White? We got about three minutes for questions. Josh, need to use the microphone to answer. Thank you. Uh, so if there are no differences in ploidy level, so what are the niches for each uh, ploidy level? Or why are, are we breeding at different ploidy levels? Uh, so, now granted, this is going to be unique to Mississippi. Um, I think ploidy levels probably do play a role um, in different areas. Uh, they're all this way, so a lot of people, there's a lot of research out there that talks about the horse quality. And I, I was wondering about the, the leaf diseases that you mentioned. I mean, you know, those 10 year experiment or with all those uh, cultivars in those different uh, months where you have the evaluation, where does the leaf disease uh, take in, in account? Uh, no, but I will say. No. Um, but I will say that, that <laughs> again, as far as we're looking at quantitative traits, not really necessarily qualitative in the variety testing um, arena, but, but I will say for the most part how it, when I look at it, I, we, we do make notes and really one out of the 11 years or 12 years I've been doing this, there's only been one year that I've actually seen yield get affected by rust um, or, or blast or something like that. So, so for the most part, yeah, I, I mean, we look at that and I mean, that, that, is, a, that is an issue, but, but for the most part, um, we didn't really address that here. Because um, I don't really think, I think for the most part, our diseases are hitting either too early or too late for our, when we're actually grazing ryegrass. In your aerial photograph there, this is distinctly darker. No, that's not mine. Yeah, that's small grains. We've got a question. One more question back there. That's the next presentation. Josh, one more question, and then yes. we'll move on. Yes. Yeah. Is there any difference in water-soluble carbohydrate content? What was it? Difference is water-soluble water soluble, water soluble carbohydrates. Yeah, no, so we didn't, we didn't look at that, but I mean, most research had pointed out on tetraploids that there usually is a higher bricks, uh, higher water-soluble content in your, in your tetraploids. But again, my argument is uh, our producers are more concerned with yield at that point, because even a, a diploid, a low-quality diploid, is still going to be more than what that cow can actually utilize. Thank you, Josh. Yep. Our next speaker is Dr. Am Lunt, and is an um, emeritus professor now and forage breeder with the uh, University of Florida. So I want to turn it to Ann. Thank you. And the, that would help. So yes, that would always help. So if you think you have a problem with extension people running long, I'm a plant breeder, but I'll do my very best not to talk genomics. 
Okay, I changed my title slightly to just expand it into plant breeding, a little bit more um, uh, related to what we have to do for the southeastern United States. And also, since this is an international meeting, anything that we develop in the south East actually works fairly well in a lot of other countries that have similar soil types. So th we think globally, and that's what we'll talk to you about today. I do want to thank um, Steve Harrison. Let me see if I can get this to advance. Okay, so I want to thank Steve Harrison at LSU for some of the photos that you're going to see today. But what I want to start out with is telling you why we've been successful with small grains breeding for forages and cover crops in the southeastern United States. We did something very uniquely with the small grains breeding programs across the southeast. And I wish one thing, that the forage folks in this audience will follow something similar to what the grain breeders have done and work across state lines regionally to develop varieties and to test material in early generations. So I want to tell you just real quickly, Sun Grains is made up of a number of land grant southern schools. They're all the plant breeders. They're mostly grain breeders, but grain, small grains, triticale, oat, rye, um, wheat, they're, they're used in the southeast, not just for the grain, but they're used as uh, forage crops predominantly. And I think sometimes grain brooders weren't thinking that part through. And so I am the forage component of the Sun Grains group. So it's a southern consortium of a number of states, and here's who we are. Uh, so we represent a lot of different uh, universities. You can check that out. And we have different crops that we work on. So I always brought the forage component to this particular sun grains operation. And I tried at one point to get the forage breeders, though there are very few of us left in the southeastern United States, to form a similar cooperative so that we are testing over a wide range of, of environments. And that's how you get stability for climatic changes. And that's why I want to address it with you today. So just to show you our success rate, when you look at what we've accomplished since 2010 when we banded it together, we have a whole number of varieties around on the market in the southeastern United States, but these are also marketed internationally. And that's because we selected under wide environments, and we also tested in a number of foreign countries. All right, so we all know why this subject is about thermic and climatic changes. Uh, obviously, it's been in the headlines, and this is just to remind you about the headlines, but, you know, hot topic, climate change. All right, so what does climate change do in plant breeding? Well, the problems we have are with excessive heat and drought. Those always come to mind. But Steve Harrison reminded me that we have a lot of flooding, and until this year, I wasn't really thinking about flooding. He's located in, LA, in Louisiana. Hurricanes, we got nailed with hurricanes this year. So flooding, actually is something we need to be breeding for resistance to, or at least tolerance to for the short term, because we've had some very dramatic um, extremes in weather. But we've also had untimely heats and freeze events. We've had some of this this year, the unpredictability of weather events. A couple of months ago, we had a dramatic freeze in uh, Florida, South Georgia, Alabama. A lot of our grain crops that we use for forages on most of our southern dairies got nailed. And for those of you in extension in this room, we had umpteen calls about what do you do to rescue a lot of the dairies that were in trouble who relied on uh, some type of conserved forages. So it, it becomes a concern when you have these unpredicted weather events. Also, when you have increasing um, clim you know, temperature effects, you have um, a lot of more disease and insect pests. Some of them are even novel diseases and pests that we've never dealt with before and really don't know how to um, incorporate the, the um, resistance to. So how does climate change impact small grains? Well, when you have um, you know, all these extremes, it affects how we, as extension folks, you have to remember I also come from an extension background too. How do you talk to folks about planting, planting dates? How are you going to manage in the event of a freeze? How are you going to manage harvesting when we have all these different types of unpredictable weather regimes? 
Um, if we don't have enough cold, because we're having you know, an increase in, in our heat, especially during the um, ripening of a lot of these forages or during the um, production period, you have to um, understand the effects of vernalization, because a lot of plants d require vernalization. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. But that there's two main points I'm going to make in how we've developed forages for the southeastern United States in the small grains area. But it was also what we did with ryegrass. So they're very similar, although one's a grain and one's considered a grass. Anyway, the other problem we had, we had a lot of warm springs, and then we would have this one freeze event, and that would have extreme effects on, on how these plants were growing. So things you have to think about, the sterility factors that come into play when you have these late freezes and you've had fairly warm winter months. So the other things that Im impacted us with the climatic changes has been if we have heavy rainfall when we're planting, we have a lot of um, uh, waterlogged soils, so the plants die from lack of oxygen, things you don't think about, which is coupled with <coughs> seed rot, right? And then we have crusting after the soils dry out. So those are things that we need to, as plant breeders, be screening for. You know, the, that comes under the heading of plant vigor or seedling vigor. Remember that? Waterlogging causes the poor plant growth, so we have had that. So if we have periodic flooding, we have log waterlogged situations, and we have um, an increase in a lot of the diseases, particularly like Fusarium and Xanthomonas. That gives us also a problem during like late rainfall, during maybe seed fill. So let me remind you why when you're thinking foragers, why is she talking about seed fill? If you don't have seed production, and most small grains that we produce in the United States for forage, we grow those seed crops in the southeastern United States. So if you want cheap seed to graze your cattle on, you better make sure at the same time you're breeding a good forage type, you're also looking at the grain production so that you can supply the next uh, season with cheap seed for um, planting. So one problem with heavy rainfall during the flowering and, and the seed fill time is pre-harvest sprouting. So that some of you may have seen in wheat fields, um, that's typically when I see it, maybe sometimes in oats that are being grown for a seed crop, you'll see after a couple of heavy rainfalls, the seed are actually sprouting on the head. So we, as breeders, select for pre-harvest sprouting. Um, low test weight, low test weight is um, a quality factor. You have to have good quality seed to plant cheap forages the following year. So these are all things that we have to screen for when we're breeding. Um, you know, heat stress doubt, and drought stress also reduce um, the yields and the, and the test weight. So water logging, I, no I normally wouldn't have thought about water logging, but again, Steve Harrison reminded me, this is Louisiana. This shows you what we're up against as breeders. And I wouldn't have thought about it until we got hit with a hurricane this year and I saw Central Florida. This is what it looks like. And, the, and when the plants come out, we really need a screen. And you might remember from botany, arincomate tissue. You, you need to actually look and see about arincomate tissue in a lot of these um, plants to see if they can survive waterlogged conditions for a couple of days. So impact of increasing temperature on small grains. The, the key with small grains is really cool nights to get it to grow well. If it's high heat all day long, like in the southeast, and then we have high heat at night, the plants do not grow well. They won't tiller well. They just don't perform well. So in the south, that's a typical thing, particularly in spring with um, warm, warm evenings. We've been very lucky this year, so seed production for next year's uh, fall planting for forages should be good in the southeast. We've been having a lot of fair, fairly cool nights, so that's helping us in the seed industry. Um, uh, just a few other things. Late planting is a very effective strategy that we use f to screen for a high um, heat tolerance. So late planting, when I plant our forages at home, a lot of times I'll wait until late November, sort of at the end of the recommended planting period. 
But late planting also tends to protect the plants because even though we recommend early planting, uh, if you don't graze that off, a lot of times the plants are very vulnerable to an early freeze event. So things that you have to screen for as you're developing forages is not a simple, straightforward you know, performance yield at the end of the season or multiple cuttings. It, it takes a lot of um, uh, different characteristics that we have to select for. The um, two most important traits to me are vernalization and photo period. So the take home message here is when breeding for warm warming environments, low or no vernalization requirement is desirable. So that we don't have to worry if we have a mild winter. The plants will actually grow. And what we see a lot of times when we get plants out of um, places like Oklahoma and Texas, and we grow them in Georgia, Florida, Alabama, if they have a strong vernalization requirement, sometimes they just sit there and they never grow at all. So vernalization is something that we need to have low or no vernalization requirement. And the other thing is most of the varieties that we've released, even in the ryegrass realm, have had low photoperiod requirements. So they're photoperiod insensitive. It doesn't really matter whether you're going into shortening days. So those are ways you can work around climate change and develop varieties that get up and get growing when we need them growing. Uh, just some other things, uh, photoperiod and vernalization. It's, it's very important to help you to be able to plant over a wide period of planting dates. So by reducing vernalization requirement and, re and making it photoperiod insensitive, that helps us too to be able to develop varieties that it doesn't matter when you plant them. So then you can plant them for forage whenever the ec environmental conditions are, are ready. In a lot of cases, most of us are dry land, so we have to wait till we have adequate rainfall, which many of us don't have during the optimum planting date for forages, which is October and early November. Just something you know people don't think about. Uh, Uniform heading reduce it and reduce fr freeze damage. Those are just you know, some thoughts that we have um, in how we develop some of the varieties. That's a picture of what our trials look like. And then, of course, with climate change and everything warming, you have to worry about disease outbreaks. And I thought, here's a little review. How about some of the diseases that we're up against? So we have a lot of folks here in Extension, a lot, and there are a number of farmers here. So wheat rust has been on the increase. Fusarium head blight, that scab. These are all diseases that I see commonly with the increasing temperatures that we're seeing. C crown rust on oat. I have now been seeing a lot more stem rust on oat, something I used to never see in our plant breeding program. But one thing that sun grains does is because we, we screen over wide vari uh, environments, we get to see a lot of these different um, diseases in different settings. Bipolaris is one you're probably familiar with, usually associated with low potash. Bacterial streaks, relatively new to the area, and wheat stripe rust is starting to come in, all because of climatic changes. Uh, aphids and um, hessian fly, two insect pest problems that are on the increase because of um, the climatic changes. So um, what do we have to do? We need to um, look at uh, breeding for tolerance, the temperature, and the rainfall extremes. We have um, a one good thing is having being able to screen large populations with the drone data, which is what you saw in the cover slide. So the, um, that allows us to go through a lot of different germplasm very quickly to s do some selections. And again, low vernalization uh, requirements important. But they can, all these forages have to yield well under optimum um, environment. So all, all in all, you got to also have performance as you're selecting for some of these uh, other traits. So this is the take home. Planning date flexibility, photo period response, vernalization requirement, heat tolerance, water logging tolerance, drought tolerance, and resistance to some of the new and old diseases. And that's what we do in sun grains. And we work collaboratively, and I'd like to see the forage folks adopt that same kind of system. Thank you. We got time for questions? Any questions? Yes, Robbie. And what's the, um, so the rust issue where we're seeing in um, ryegrass and oats, what's the, 
chance in using small grains of cover cropping are we going to see the potential for that interaction with field crops? Is there any chance of transferability there? Well, not between, not between the diseases on ryegrass and small grains because they're different. Um, they're all Puxenia, but different species and different biotypes within. But as we start increasing cover cropping on small grains across the southeastern United States, I can speak for that, we'll probably see uh, more biotypes, more races coming into play. So breeders are going to have to be very careful. It's just because there's be so much more out there and the chance of mutations is going to increase, I, I imagine, with increased acreage. Is that along the lines? Any other questions? At least I didn't talk about genomics. Well, thank you, Anne. Okay. Appreciate it. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jennifer Tucker. Uh, Jennifer is with the University of Georgia at Tifton campus. And Jennifer, make sure that I get it correctly. It's, it's a, you're a four slash talk nutritionist, correct? <laughs> I want to make sure you get it. It's all yours. All right, I'm going to get on this side so I can see you all. And, uh, so uh, Rocky asked me to come and talk a little bit about alfalfa production uh, in the south. And so I always start these discussions uh, with pointing out where Georgia is. And a lot of you all know, but not everybody. So this is Georgia. And this is a map of alfalfa production in the United States. So why in the world would somebody from Georgia come up and talk about alfalfa production? And it's because it's a common known thing that alfalfa will not grow in the south. Right? Except that it's not. All right? And we have actually shown through many years, uh, through lots of research, that alfalfa does, in fact, grow very well in the south, in the coastal plains, uh, in the deep south. And this work has happened all across the south, in many states across the south. But we do know that there's some differences in the way that we do it. And some of the things that we think about is how can we make the alfalfa that we're using more adaptable to our environment. Some of that is through selecting varieties uh, that have been bred for our environment. I'm not a breeder, so I'm not going to talk about that. But we do pick those varieties. But also we use varieties that are dual use, uh, that maybe have different um, applications or alternatives and then the other way that we are seeing an increase in alfalfa production is the consideration of a mixture rather than a pure stand. So we know when we're adding legumes to grass that that's going to improve our forage quality. Something that we're doing effectively in Georgia is combining the queen of forages with the king of warm season grasses in Bermuda grass, and we found a winning combination. This can also work with Bahia grass, and I know Dr. Lemus has done a lot of that work in Mississippi, uh, but we're really finding that this is a way to get increased adoption of alfalfa back in the region, in a region where people think that it won't grow there. So we have several advantages uh, when we look at alfalfa in a mixture, as particularly with a warm season grass mixture. So commonly when we think about alfalfa mixtures, we think the addition of, of orchard grass or something later in a thinning stand of alfalfa and a combination with a cool season. In this situation, we are looking with alfalfa with a warm season grass. It's going to increase our yield per unit area. It increases our quality, which then turns into decreased supplementation for our livestock when we feed it. Uh, it increases the dry down time compared to alfalfa production alone. Uh, it would do a little bit different if you're looking at Bermuda grass production alone. And it's going to extend that land use. It really helps us to fill in the forage gaps that we see in the deep south when we're looking for those grazing windows. Uh, and if all else fails, and if your alfalfa doesn't come up, you still have something in that field, which seems to be a security system that a lot of these producers, as they inch back into alfalfa production, they like to have a little bit of that. Uh, so this is not an original idea. I'm not one of the first people to do this. This has been going on for a number of years. Uh, a great effort across America's alfalfa across the southeast, but why are we consider looking at this system? If you look at the alfalfa growth curves, and we are in the coastal zone, that's where we're located in Georgia, and then you look at the Bermuda grass go growth curves there, we see that these two have very complementary growth. When we see that we have a slump in alfalfa production, that's when we're seeing the greatest amount of our warm season grass or our Bermuda grass production. Now, a lot of people wonder what that's going to do. Are they going to compete? 
are they going to complement? Uh, luckily, we have a, a lot of data and research now that really illustrates that ebb and flow relationship. So we see that they really complement each other very well. We have good production of alfalfa in the spring. We go into those summer months, that Bermuda grass is really contributing. We go into the fall months and that alfalfa starts to take over again, which works out really good uh, for a system, especially when you're looking at extending that grazing system. Uh, as I mentioned, see, this I like this map a lot better because uh, it's not white in all of those southern states. Uh, so America's alfalfa and forage genetics uh, have been working as well as University of Georgia and several universities across the south to put in a lot of alfalfa stands, alfalfa demonstrations. So this is proof that alfalfa does in fact grow or at least has been planted uh, in the deep south. So I'm going to go through just a few projects that we've done in Tifton. Obviously, we don't have much time, so I'm not going to give a lot of the details. Feel free to catch any of us afterwards. Several of the students uh, that have worked are around here working this uh, particular event, so it's uh, beneficial for us. Uh, but one of the first things that I did when I got to Georgia was I looked at an evaluation of alfalfa Bermuda grass under baleage production. So it's a comparison of Bermuda grass alone to the mixture of alfalfa and Bermuda grass together. We're using Bulldog 805. It is a semi to non-dormant alfalfa variety bred for Georgia to, to you know, survive in that environment. Uh, this was a three-year evaluation, but at the end, we did find that the advantage went to the mixture. All right, so when we looked at the number of harvests, we had a greater number of harvests, a greater uh, amount of tonnage per acre produced annually, and a greater quality product every year after that establishment year. So it just automatically right there, looking at that, if you're trying to talk to a producer, all of a sudden you're going from, you know, four tons to 10 tons or four cuttings to eight cuttings, which I really thought was a selling point until you realize that not everybody wants to be on a tractor on eight harvests across the year. So we did start to kind of adjust some of our thoughts there. So then the question came, well, how long will this alfalfa last in the Deep South, right? It's not going to, it cannot possibly do what it does in these other regions. So we continued that project out and harvested the alfalfa Bermuda grass all the way through five years, which is your general alfalfa life stand that people look at. And we see that the trends follow the same as alfalfa production. We're going to see an increase in yield in years two and three. You're going to start to see that decline in the alfalfa yield in years four and five. And then you can make decisions at that point as to what you're going to do with the life of the stand. So it really follows what alfalfa production does nationwide. Again, with our quality, uh, we do point out that in the first year, that was the establishment year, we don't recommend fall or spring establishment, but I didn't start till January, so I couldn't control that. And we did not catch up on our quality until that second year. Uh, but we do see that increased yield continuing. I work in a beef system. If we have 17% crew protein in that year five product, we're still pretty happy about that. Another evaluation that we did was looking at uh, alfalfa under grazing systems, alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures. We were looking at this both from the contribution of nitrogen to the system as well as the impacts of grazing on the alfalfa. Uh, from this work, again, we saw that the mixture outperformed the monoculture, right? Outperformed the Bermuda grass monoculture. Uh, we don't really worry so much about average daily gain. We talk about it a lot, but what we really took away from this is the increased stocking rate and the increased gain per hectare we had in that mixture versus those, uh, um, those monocultures. And again, that increase in that quality product for those animals. A few conclusions that we took from this particular study is, you know, as long as you have lots of rain and active growth, you're fine. Right, but as soon as you hit a drought, if you aren't having a longer than 21 day rest period, you'll end up really damaging that alfalfa. So even though we pushed it, we learned don't push it, essentially. Uh, this ran into another project. Again, we talked about that. Does everybody want to spend eight times a year on a harvester or whatever? How do we want to uh, figure out how to best manage these systems uh, looking at contrasting defoliation management strategies. And so I thank my colleague, Dr. Lisa Baxter, for this drone picture here. It's a great illustration of the work we were doing in Tifton. Uh, but we had a different treatment where we cut this system for baleage. That's all we did in there for two years. We added this system here, uh, which would be a cut and graze system. So we grazed it. We cut baleage off of it. We let it rest. And then we went in and we stockpile grazed it later in the system. 
And then in these other systems here, we just grazed until we couldn't graze anymore. And we stopped that system. Now we did this both in Alabama and in Georgia. This is just to kind of show you what active grazing, we did a seven day rotation and a 28 day rest period when we got back into that first rotation. This is what our stockpile grazing systems look like. So we would, instead of moving the area, we would we increase the area instead of uh, changing the number of animals. We had the same set stocking, but we would increase that area as we would go and we would move those every three days. Uh, so a pretty good distance in there and that 11 is November. We are grazing in November and into December in this system. Uh, the results from this work, again, it was a two-year evaluation. Uh, when we look at the total days of use, we didn't see much difference in our first year. Uh, that's the establishment year, right? So we're going to start later in the year to even get started in the spring, and we're going to kind of cut it off a little bit early in the fall because we don't want to do anything to really hinder the growth of that alfalfa for the long term. We want this here for a long time. In the second year, we did see that there was a little bit of separation in that use, uh, more specifically on when we were able to use that. And this is where that cut and graze or that dual use system really started to shine. So uh, we, were, we looked at that data from that standpoint, uh, but then you have all these different systems, right? And then you gotta figure out how you're gonna statistically analyze this. Uh, and thankfully, again, we have Dr. Lisa Baxter. So we did a live weight gain or, a, or an estimated live weight gain. And normally you would say, well, that A, that bar is the biggest, that's the best, right? But when you start to really look at it, we were trying to figure out how to optimize this system. And the way to optimize this system was actually using the dual use system and the cut and grace system here. So we find that strategic management in the dual use system is going to be the best management practice for producers in the southeast that have both hay equipment and animals to graze, right? They have those equipment uh, to optimize the use of this mixture on that single use of land, that single unit of land. Now, this area is still in research, uh, so we were able to get more funding for this, and now we're looking at nutrient preservation, utilization, and cycling in sustainable southeastern livestock systems. What we're doing is we're focusing, specific, focusing specifically on that dual use system. In this system, we are cutting baleage early in the spring. We are cutting until we get into the summer. We're allowing that forage to rest through the summer months when that alfalfa is going to be the most stressed out. And then we start grazing September 1. Why September 1? Where we're located, September 1 is when those warm seasons are starting to shut down and there's not a lot of grazing options. So this first year we did this grazing, we started September 1. We grazed into November in an extreme drought. We didn't have rain from September 1 to that time period. So had we had timely rain, we probably could have continued going. Uh, this is really working out and it's drawing a lot of attention from our producers because they're not grazing anything. They're already thinking about feeding hay. Their ryegrass, which is a wonderful forage, isn't doing anything yet. So it's really fitting in well in that, in that environment. Another thing that comes in, a lot of questions, uh, and Kendall is actually here in the room right now, um, we, and she actually presented this the other day, but the question was, well, what about our timing is of establishment, because no matter how many times and how many pubs you say, establish this in the fall, it works best in the fall, sometimes seeing is believing. So we went ahead and we reestablished and we looked at the establishment time. But the second thing that we were looking at from a pasture situation is how much crabgrass contribution actually impacts that alfalfa Bermuda grass mixture. Is it worth that money that we put in to control that crabgrass? This is a pretty interesting study, and I'm not going to give all of the data. Again, Kendall presented that the other day. Uh, but we do have this aerial view of the plots where we have our unfertilized control and our grass plus nitrogen. We have our fall planted, and then we have our spring planted. Now, just looking at that, you can really see the difference in the fall and the spring planted alfalfa. And um, the, real, the realization that we see from here from a data standpoint is you never really catch up with what the potential yield is if you take that, if you bite the bullet and you plant it in the spring. All right, so you want to always try to get that in in the fall. Wow, that is jumping fast. Um, so again, when we looked at it, this is just a location one data. Uh, this, the data from year two location follows the same trend. Uh, we see that the, you're going to have a greater yield with that fall planted than that spring planted uh, data. So we. We're really excited about this because it was very clean uh, data. 
from the crabgrass standpoint, we really didn't see that it impacted quality. Uh, and so, you know, if you're in a pasture situation, maybe you don't need to consider uh, having to control that. Lessons that we've learned the hard way. We've been doing this for about eight years now. Uh, seed depth is of the utmost import of importance. Too deep, too bad, right? The number of times that I have gone to a field or I have gone to a field that I have planted uh, and learned this lesson. So we want to make sure you're seeing seed on the top of the ground as you're planting. That's deep enough. Uh, is Roundup Ready worth it is a question that we have. In a mixed system, do we want to consider Roundup Ready? At first, I was like, there's no point in that. Actually, there is. It's a lot of worth and a lot of power in that when you can use that Roundup across that warm season to continue to suppress that grass. Uh, so it actually is really uh, starting to pay off for itself, uh, even in a mixture. Uh, don't skimp on potassium. That tends to be one of our biggest problems that we see in both alf uh, alfalfa and Bermuda grass problem areas. When in doubt, scout. So you do need to be out in that field, seeing what's happening, looking and, and looking for insects. They are uh, out in that field to so be doing that. Unless you test, it's just a guess. So you can think you have a high quality product, but the only way you can know that is if you take a forage test. And alfalfa will absolutely grow in the south. Now, really quickly, we do have some resources available if anybody's interested. On the Southeast Cattle Advisor page, we have the alfalfa Bermuda grass checklist and extension budgets for people that are interested. So we have been developing a lot of resources uh, in this area to kind of increase that alfalfa production. The alfalfa Bermuda grass and management guide and calendar, and these are available at the Oregon Forages booth. So if you want to get them at this particular event. Uh, growing alfalfa in the south and alfalfa for beef cows are both available on the National Alfalfa and Forage Alliance webpage. And we have the newest release of the Reference Guide of Legumes and their role in southeast also available at the Oregon Forages booth. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions? What are your thoughts about growing uh, alfalfa with other Bermuda grass varieties? Uh, so that's an interesting question, and a lot of our work is focused on Tifton 85 and, uh, and the alfalfa in it. But what it really started with most producers when they were doing this, we were using lesser Bermuda grass varieties. And so when we put those two together, we were real concerned that the Tifton 85 would be so robust that it wouldn't match well. Right now, we haven't found a Bermuda grass that it doesn't work well. It doesn't work with all alfalfas. So some alfalfas can't handle the competition, but right now we haven't found a Bermuda grass that doesn't work in. Jennifer, I guess also when you look at that competition, you have to look at also raw spacing. What kind of raw spacing are you using uh, on the mixes versus a pure stand? Are you using the same raw spacing or are you making a variation of that? Right, and so what we have found, and I think you all did the same work uh, in Mississippi, but uh, we are sticking with the 14 inch row spacing or every other row in the drill. Uh, we, did, we did some preliminary work just to confirm that. Again, if you are in a seven inch row spacing on the drill, you shade out your Bermuda grass and you end up with Bahia grass, because we did that. Uh, if you go to 21 inches, so further than every other hole on the drill, uh, you end up with that robust Bermuda grass and it starts to shade out your alfalfa. So we really found a sweet spot uh, with that 14 inch row spacing. And the seeding rate, when we go to that, we cut to 12 to 15 pounds to the acre. Uh, but that's a, a function of cutting down to every other hole. So essentially, you're planting half the acreage if you're using half of this, the holes. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Leanne Diller. She's the uh, Extension for Special with Auburn University and look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Rocky. So um, as Rocky mentioned, I am at Auburn University, so I cover the state of Alabama. And one reason I, I think Rocky asked me to give this talk was because Alabama has had a long history of development 
of legume species, especially annual legumes. So I'm going to kind of take you all on a history tour, but also throw in some more recent stuff on the Forbes side that I've been adding to it. So we're going to we're going to go back and talk about some some older data, but also um, some some more recent stuff as well. So I'm preaching to the choir when I say this, but I always want to make sure that you know we're all on the same page and really talk about why we want to do this. We're not putting legumes in this system compared to alfalfa where we're really maximizing the yield. With these annual legumes, typically, they're going to have some yield addition to our system, but there's a whole other uh, allotment of things they're going to bring to the table. So a lot of times we can extend the grazing season either early on if you're using a ryegrass system, which we talked about. It's kind of the bread and butter of the deep south. Oh, also, for those of you who may not be from the the U.S. since Jennifer did it. We are, are the western neighbor of Georgia, so we are going to be touching the Gulf Coast just north of Florida. I find most international people know Florida. Disney World, we're about five hours north of Disney World, okay? So we are in a very hot and humid climate. So for us, ryegrass is our bread and butter, so either we can add it, add some grazing on the front end with these brassicas in particular, but also a lot of times if we're working with small grains, they may add some on the back end. They do increase our forage nutritive value, which in my situation, I honestly, I'm kind of like with Josh, that is not really a huge necessary thing. We have some really high quality things. We're working mostly with beef cattle, at least in Alabama. So it does improve our forage quality, but that's not just the, the main reason we're going to do this. One thing that we're starting to learn a lot more about is soil health. And I know this is a, that is a Pandora's box, that term, and I don't really like to use it, but it's a term that generally describes the fact that we're going to be adding things to the soil instead of just taking them out. And legumes really help us do that. Also, legumes specifically, they fix nitrogen. That's important as an extension specialist. I can tell producers all day long why it's good for the environment when it comes down to it, if I can help them with the their bottom line, that this is an easy way to do that. Also, it benefits the, 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 their, the environment as well, excuse me. But for me, I'm also talking about brassicas. Brassicas, unfortunately, don't do that, but they do have the ability to increase that nutrient cycling as well as do some nutrient mi mining. And another area that I'm really interested in that we're really come to the forefront is this idea of secondary plant metabolites. Now, as we speak, there is a session on secondary plant metabolites, which I would like to be at because they're going to be talking about some of this stuff. But also, we have seen some things like isoflavins, uh, glucosinolates, and condensed tannins, or we're starting to learn while they may have some bad qualities are also starting to bring something to the table to benefit. And I'll try to touch on all of those. So in the Southeast US, when we're talking about annual legumes, we're going to be talking about the, the big one is going to be crimson clover. Crimson clover is by far the number one annual, annual legume in our system. Another one, ball clover. And just to give a you know, shameless plug, there is an AU Dawn ball clover. I always do this to embarrass Dr. Ball. But uh, the story is that he wouldn't let Dr. Van Santen name a variety after him until after he retired. And he retired, so they released AU Dawn. Um, I don't think there's a Dillard clover, so I think I'm safe. But there is a, um, an AU Don ball clover that's an Auburn variety that's been released. And then other used ones, Verseem, you may know as Egyptian clover. Red clover, you may be familiar with and think of it as either a biennial or perennial. Well, in our system, it's actually going to act as an annual, and we can use it in such way. Arrow leaf, which is an older type clover that's not used as much, but in the system. And some of the lesser known ones, subterranean, hairy, or common vetch, and Austrian winter pea. Now, when we're talking about forbs, there's a lot of things that are there. Mainly what I'm going to be talking about are brassicas. I put chicory and plantain on here. If you're from other parts of the U.S. or other parts of the world, you may use those quite considerably. I'm not going to say they don't work. We have a lot of buckhorn plantain in the southeast. But those aren't ones we haven't really started putting into our system. Our focus has been brassicas. And those are going to be our turnips, our radishes, our rape seeds, um, hybrids, which several companies have hybrids that we've worked with that work quite well. So when we're looking at this and we look at the growth pattern of all of these, I like to tell people I really like working with cool season systems and annual systems because it's like a puzzle. How do I fit all that together? So when I'm trying to figure out that puzzle for any farmer, the first thing I do is look at when these grow. And when we're looking at this, we can generally say our brassicas are going to be our Thanksgiving to Christmas food. And then our clovers are usually going to be our 
Easter to mid-May food. So usually, and it, these, there's a little bit of difference between our clovers, but in general, um, we have there's some data coming from Alabama that shows they're gonna peak in performance in that April to May timeline. So where brassics are with front end, so we can put in small grains here in the middle where we could cover that and have some more production. In general, our brassicas are just not going to be, I, I wish I could say this is not the case because I'm a really big brassica fan, but they're just super high in moisture. And so they're just not going to give us a lot of times the dry matter yield that I would like, but they still bring something to the table, usually about 750,000 pounds or 750 to 1,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. Our clovers are very variable, but you see we have our crimson, our arrow leaf, and bursim that are usually some of our top performers in terms of our dry matter yield. Now, another thing I always um, want to bring up is the quality. It is important. I mentioned that you know when we're looking at our cold season annual systems, they're super high quality, and probably looking at their you know when we're looking at beef systems, which is what we're focused on they're usually gonna meet the demands quite easily, especially for our dry cows. But I think it's also important to bring in. Um, one thing I will say, beef people, we like to use TDN. We don't like to use energy values because um, we save that for dairy people, which I was told yesterday drove one of the scientists crazy, but I'm gonna leave TDN in there for now. I've been converted to a beef person. So when we look at our seasonal yield, now this is total yield across the season, and this is from a variety of different papers um, that come from North Carolina, Alabama, um, as well as some other places, we look that we're gonna be in that 3,000 to 5,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare in terms of production. It's gonna vary a little bit, but that's where we are in our legumes with our brassicas being more about 1,500 to 2,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. But when we look at our crude protein, all of them are gonna be over 15%. When we look at our beef system, a growing beef animal, a steer needs about 16% crude protein requirement. So here we're not gonna need any supplementation. We're providing that to that animal. And in terms of TDN, anywhere from 60 to 82%, I will say the brassicas tend to be higher in TDN or energy value compared to the legumes, but all of them are gonna be high quality. Again, our beef, a growing beef animal, if you're looking at a yearling steer, it's gonna be about 65% TDN requirement. So um, high enough to meet those demands and, and put good gains on those animals, which is uh, our system in the Southeast. We use um, cow-calf system mostly. But if any of you have ever worked with legumes, and Jennifer just talked about interseeded <laughs> legume grass systems and there's a lot of problems with just grazing them so we want to add them in mixture so i would never go out to producer and have them plant these so my work has mostly focused on how to put these legumes and forbs in with grasses so when i'm talking about that that's going to be what ann and josh talked about so our small grains cereal rye wheat triticale oat we don't do barley in alabama it doesn't work well um, but those small grains, also annual ryegrass. So a lot of our systems are integrated crop livestock systems. We'll have a session about that on Thursday. But those systems, we don't use ryegrass because it tends to become a weed and cause problems with our, our crow crop systems. But when we're overseeding our worm season perennials, Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, we're gonna use that annual ryegrass as well. And I can usually, in this system, be able to get forage on the ground from Thanksgiving all the way through at least Cinco de Mayo. I like using holidays. I find producers really, they associate better, and plus it's just more fun, right, to talk about holidays. So, um, Or if you're Star Wars inclined, it's Revenge of the Fifth, right, instead of Cinco de Mayo. But that was, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So, I mean, y'all are as bad as producers, guys. So, when we look at uh, botanical composition, so one thing, and um, we have several of our agents from Alabama in the room, they know when I talk about brassicas, the first thing I say is they're just not consistent. The great thing is we're talking about three pounds to the acre, of roughly 3.3 kilograms per hectare in terms of seeding rate. Usually it's pretty cheap to put those in there. It's more of an insurance policy. If it's great, grows, it's great. If it doesn't, then it's not the end of the world. But we did a study in central Alabama several years ago where we were looking at basically the idea of ensiling different mixtures with brassicas. Brassicas are very wet, so we weren't sure if we can ensile them. And legumes have a buffering capacity to make them different to ensile. So we were trying to compare those two systems. Now, what we typically do in these systems, we're talking about 66 kilograms of our small grain, in this case wheat, in terms of planting about 
0.9 kilograms of our crimson clover per hectare seeding rate and the 3.3, I told you, um, kilograms of the brassica. So in the system, we saw that with our brassicas, we were able to get, um, we had a much uh, lower stand than we did with our clover. Our clover with our stand, and these were grown in adjacent fields. Unfortunately, we had some stand issues, so I didn't get good rep uh, repetitive data in these fields, so it's not statistically analyzed. But you saw that with the crimson clover, we had almost 55 to 60 percent crimson clover in that stand. It was very competitive, where we had about 45 percent wheat, where in the brassica, we had much majority of wheat with a lower amount of brassica. This also just goes to the growth habit of the brassicas coming in earlier and um, the crimson clover coming in later in the season and possibly shading out some of that wheat. So this is a separate study that we did. This would have been done in South Alabama, so very close to Mariana, Florida. We were looking at a oat, cereal, rye, crimson clover, brassica mixture and looked at botanical composition based on different length of grazing. So in this system, we were just trying to look at how um, different lengths of grazing those cover crops affected the botanical composition as well as other parameters. But what we saw was that when we were grazing it, it really didn't matter across the season how long we grazed it. Our proportion stayed about the same of our brassica and our legume with our grass dominating the system. Now we didn't break out cereal grain versus or cereal rye versus oat. That definitely changed throughout the season based on the cereal rye being much uh, earlier than the oat, but when we just looked at average grass, we saw pretty consistent. And I just included this mainly to say the composition, even if you plant at the same seeding rate, year to year, location to location is going to vary quite a bit. So that kind of plays into your management. There's no golden ticket to say a piece of a puzzle I can put together. Um, this is a study out of Louisiana, and I've attempted to cover up some, or add some color to this to make it easier to read, where they're looking at a more complex mixture. So for the most part, when I'm working with producers, just because these mixtures can get really intense, I focus on four to five species. If you're familiar with any of the stuff, you may have worked with Ray's Crazy Mix. I believe that has eight or 10 species in it. So how do those work together is a completely different complex story. So in this study, they were looking at cereal rye, annual rye grass as the grass components, with arrowleaf in the green, peas, it was uh, winter pea, in the orange, vetch is going to be the blue, and then the lines are gonna be your average daily gain. And so as you can see, I feel like this one just gives a good depiction of how those legumes change across the season. Early in the season, you have much more component of peas. They play out mid-April, so right here is gonna be the beginning of April, and that's when your vetch comes in a little bit more. Arrowleaf clover, again, being more of a later one, is gonna be more that late season into June, and then by early June, it, the system has played out. So when they did this study, and I, I put this to include this study because they did some economics I'll get to in just a second, but when they looked at, there was no difference between rye, ryegrass, with nitrogen fertilizer and then no nitrogen fertilizer but the replacement of those legumes that I just mentioned. They saw no different in steer grazing days per hectare, no difference in average daily gains or total gain per hectare. So the system was in this essentially the same in terms of performance. So then they wanted to look at the economics and to see if the no difference in gain and the reduction in need of nitrogen fertilizer gave an economic benefit. So, and I won't go through all of these, but these are their production parameters in terms of their cost. When it came down to it, they, their total cost was $569 per hectare in the, with the nitrogen fertility, 550 when they added the legumes. Obviously, take off the nitrogen fertilizer, but add the legume seed in that case. Unfortunately, even though the value of the gain for the animals was the same, just due to this, even though it wasn't significantly different, they did see right there was a slightly lower amount of gain on those animals. So when it came out, the net return was the same. So in these systems, we're really promoting them as being uh, more economic. Unfortunately, a lot of times the economics don't play out. The good thing is the economics are usually never negative. I can at least tell producers they're not going to be worse off by adding in legumes and taking out nitrogen fertility. They just won't necessarily be ahead. 
So one thing I wanted to mention, just as I mentioned earlier, was this idea of secondary plant metabolites. So I spent um, part of my career looking at brassicas and glucosinolates. Those are organosulfur compound, com compounds within the brassica. And when we look at those, we see in this study, we were just comparing ryegrass as our control with canola, rapeseed, and turnip, three different brassica species, and total methane. And we just saw that, as you can see here, that there was a considerable, there's about a fifth or at least a third less methane production on the brassicas and in, in a continuous culture system. And then what's really cool is as you go down based on the amount of dry organic matter fed or NDF fed, you see a substantial decrease in methane production, um, enteric methane production. So, and numbers are great, but I always like to show this graph to show the, visually the difference. So when we're looking at this, we have a lot of potential, potential environmental benefits we may not be capturing, because even when we think about annual ryegrass as being pretty nutritive and probably very low in methane production um, compared to maybe Bermuda grass or Bahia grass, we do see though that if we add these in there, we're going to be, see a huge diminishing in methane, which is also more efficient for the animal. So conclusions implication is, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, add legumes to the system, add forbs to there. They're going to add to your system. And there's a lot of potential there to add more. We also haven't looked at the idea of how these secondary plant metabolites interact in the soil. Can they interact with different bad or good soil microbes to benefit that. It's so uncharted territory, but there's a lot of potential for that, especially in the Southeast. Jennifer already mentioned it, but I have the actual book. So make sure you pick up one of these very pretty, even though it's purple, legume books um, to learn more about forages and legumes specifically in the Southeast. And with that, I will take any questions. We got one minute for questions. So any question from the audience? Okay, so the question is about the, the type of glucosinolates, and of course you're going to ask me that because it's been, that data's from about six years ago. So we did measure all of them. So we looked at, we did a survey, I was working with a very uh, smart chemist that did a survey of them. We were able to capture the top 24. Um, I can't remember which one at the top of my head was the highest. I do have that it's in my publication, but we were doing the total. We didn't just pick one. So, and then we did go back and I actually did a regression of the glucosinolate concentration, individual and total with the methane, and it didn't seem to affect it. But all of those brassicas had roughly the same proportion of those different glucosinolates. If we had picked something else, it might have changed that. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you. Our next speaker is, uh, Dr. Marcelo Wallau with the uh, University of Florida and Dr. Lisa Baxter with the uh, University of Georgia. They are both uh, extension forage specialists at their respective uh, land-grant universities. Yes, uh, thank you, Rocky, for the introduction. Thank you, uh, everybody, for being here today. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. And I'm proud of representing a large team of uh, forage specialists and also breeders because we need to work together to make sure the developments of the new forage varieties are getting into, into the breeding. So Dr. Lisa Baxter, Dr. Ann Blount, Dr. Stephen Rios, and Dr. Jean Vendramini, uh, all of us from Florida, but for, for Lisa. And when we first came up with the idea of this action, actually Rocky, Rocky was proposing, we do a lot of variety trials, right? We're always testing new varieties, and many times those are seen as, uh, and let's put in quotes, lesser research because it's not very, uh, um, high science is very applied and sometimes we feel like we don't have a lot to show but actually those are extremely important this extremely important research even those demonstrations because we are learning and we are telling our farmers about these new varieties we're learning how the environment work how those varieties work and testing them periodically on multiple different locations so that's how it came and also um, I mentioned Rocky, oh, this would be great for me to put together some data on sorghum that I had. So he asked me to talk about Bahia grass and Bermuda grass. Well, <laughs> not a problem. Bahia grass and Bermuda grass are the backbone of the cow calf industry in the Southeast. Mostly because they are perennial, no cost beyond establishment. There is, we don't have to establish them every year. They are normally lower 
cost over time, fairly low maintenance, fairly tolerate to grazing and fairly persistent. Those are very general terms. There is a lot of management and also variety involved on those arguments there. Um, many of those are also used in landscape sports and utility that brings, especially those here, lots of royalties for us, uh, especially UF and UGA have a, a, a lot of uh, turf grasses that are Bermuda grass and Bahia grass that are very famous. I'm going to focus only on the forage side here. And we do have a very, a very large plant breeding program that has advanced a lot over the last few decades. The general focus has been on increasing forage accumulation and nutritive value with the goal of increasing stocking rate and animal performance. Of course, disease resistance, as Dr. Blount mentioned before, has always been there, nematode resistance, rust resistance, uh, and other, other environmental issues that we look for, but mainly we're looking for production nutritive value that we can go and release and um, go and improve animal performance uh, ultimately. However, despite this great advancement in forage breeding, our producers are still using a lot of common varieties. So what are we, do what are we doing wrong here? Why are, not, why are those varieties that we're promoting and breeding and advancing and releasing year after year not being so used? So this is kind of the main questions, the question we have here in this paper. I'm going to start talking a little bit about Bermuda and Bahia grass very briefly. So estimated uh, Bermuda grass production here in the southeast, and I believe everybody here is familiar with, um, uh, I see most, most known faces, so uh, you know our, our region here. Most of the Bahia grass is going to be limited to the, to the southern part of the southeast region. Um, we estimate about 2 million hectares mostly diploid type, especially as you go a little up north because tetraploids are restricted to the, lower, to the lower latitudes because of cold tolerance. Most of the breeding focus has also been dedicated to diploids, especially because it's much easier to, to uh, breed diploids because the apomitic nature of the tetraploid bahia grass. Focus on cold tolerance like the Auburn Sand Mountain or extended growing season of Tiff Creek in Riata, UF Riata, uh, UGA Tiffquick. And on the tetraploid side, mostly Argentine. We've been using Argentine forever. There were some varieties that came into the market but that are not widely used that are tetraploids. New, um, new varieties from Argentina and Uruguay have been released in the recent past, not available to my knowledge, yet in the US market. We do have some new materials being evaluated, and it's one of the research from my master's student that we recently published, looking at different grazing intensities. And I'm here, we're only using grazing intensity as a way to impose stress to the plants to, to, to be able to select. There is no grazing management uh, hypothesis behind this trial. It's only so we can impose heavy or moderate grazing intensity to be able to select varieties that are more lines that are more persistent under grazing. And here we do, we use some statistical tools to be able to compile many traits like height, crude protein, cover, early forage, allow forage accumulation, which is important for us, uh, in a way to combine all those here in the canonical analysis to distinguish, to try to find some hybrid, some lines that would be more promising. This trial, um, this trial is published, but we still have not made a decision in terms of release for a tetraploid bahia grass, hopefully in the next three or four years. Some of the challenges on bahia grass, seed production, and you can talk to any county agent, we are talking, we're telling people, go use UF Riata, go use Sand, Mount, uh, Sand Mountain or Tiffquick, where to get seeds. Seed production is a main limitation, and then seed prices are very high. Aligned to that, our farmers normally prefer the brown bag or what they call the second generation. The second generation is super cool because they'll tell you, I have this bahia grass here, is a second generation or a cousin of teeth quick. That means somebody planted teeth quick and harvest that for seed and sold to the neighbor, which is not, it's not allowed. But it goes in the brown bag, don't have any regulation, don't have any certification, and becomes a big problem because there is no control in terms of seed quality which leads to another major, major issue with the diploid Pensacola type bahia grasses, which is Brunswick grass. Another issue we're facing, uh, low germination, 
this, the seeds are viable, but germination sometimes is low, and that's also a main problem in those uh, in Bahia grass. Getting into the Bermuda grass, and uh, Dr. Baxter had given a presentation already on Bermuda grass. I'm going to cut this short. There is a whole world of Bermuda grass to talk about. Most widely used for hay, uh, and also for, as a synonym for high quality forage. We estimate over 10 million hectares in the southeast, and I couldn't find a good picture from forage production. I'm not good on maps, so I'm using a turf, a turf uh, picture here. Uh, but basically, this is the distribution of the Bermuda grass. It can go a little bit up and, and, and west here, but mostly the Bermuda grass concentrated in here. Normally, compared to, Bermuda, to Bahia grass, we're looking into higher maintenance cost, higher, but also higher production and higher nutritive value. Many, many releases, especially from Tifton, over the past many uh, multiple decades. Just to name a few, Coastal, Coastal uh, Coast Cross, Alicia, Tifton, 44 jigs. I, uh, Tifton 85 is the most widely known and is actually very hard to beat Tifton 85. I'm going to show some info on that. And recently we have two releases from Florida, Ms. Levy and Newell. And we also have uh, a new project with uh, Dr. Bill Anderson and uh, Dr. Baxter and Dr. Rios to release a few more varieties in the, new future, in the, in the near future. And then you ask people what they want, they are always talking about coastal. You ask horse folks, they want coastal hay. They don't even know what coastal is or what type of variety it is, but coastal became a synonym of Bermuda grass. And everybody wants to talk about coastal. Just a little bit of a breeding slide. This is a, a paper that, uh, from, from Dr. Rio's group. This is uh, forage accumulation. This is in vitro total dry matter. Uh, digestibility in the number of genotypes, meaning how many lines evaluated were in this range here. And you can see that Tiffany 85 is still hard to beat both in terms of forage accumulation and dry matter digestibility. I'm not going to talk much about those, but those here are names of seeded varieties. Normally they are lower performing in our region compared to the, to the hybrids and uh, vegetatively propagated varieties. Now, you look into here in terms of herbage accumulation, uh, and we did make some progress in, uh, in relation to Tiffany 85 with this PI here, which is new, one of the new varieties. We did make some progress in multiple locations, um, and that became one of our, our new flagship Bermuda grass in Florida. Okay, one of the things I like about new and some of the new stuff is also because they are very early growing, this is, this is in January, okay, it was a mild winter, but when you compare Newell to Tiffany 85, there was a lot of growth early season on that variety. And we've been expanding that a lot on farm, which is one of the main limitations. We have, this is vegetative of a planted material, and we need, to, we need to generate a lot of material to be able to give to the farmers, which also is a hindrance for adoption, because establishment with vegetative plant material is expensive and labor consuming. But it's, it's very interesting. We do see a lot of differences in establishment uh, based on the variety. It is a 65 day, 60 days after planting, and you can see there's a lot of difference in growth here. So some of those varieties were hoping to be able to, to be able to develop those based more on uh, vegetative tops instead of rhizomes, so uh, stolons instead of uh, rhizomes. Pests and diseases, also Bermuda grass stem maggot is one of our main issues here. Rust and fall army wars, army worm became, became an issue. I'm going to go quickly just to mention a few other grasses that are also of important and interest, especially more for Florida in, uh, in the Gulf Coast a little more. One is limpo grass that can be used in low areas or that are fod prone and it's very good for winter production in South Florida. It does produce a lot of biomass during the winter, although it's a C4 summer perennial grass. And we use for stockpile because of the high nutritive value, high digestibility, even, uh, uh, even stockpile, uh, as stockpile forage. I just want to introduce you a concept here. This is the change in Limpo grass cover or weed frequency, one of criteria that we use for selection. 
after two years of grazing, how was the persistence, how was that cover? And we judged that grazing, especially because most of those forages are going to be used for grazing. A grazing evaluation is essential part of the cultivar development to make sure that when we, did, we release those, they are going to withstand, withstand the use. Uh, other warm season perennial grasses that we also use, Derraginia grass and Brachiaria grass, and this is a, a project for, from Dr. Vendramini. We can see that they are Camelo and Spain, two different cultivars here. They do perform quite well. They have a long, uh, high yielding potential, yielding potential even in Florida, but we're still, still uh, having problems with persistence, especially cold tolerance especially after two years. So those are not yet playing a major role as cool season for us, uh, warm season perennial forages in our region. Okay, so just a little bit of, that was an overview of what we have in terms of options and what we have been doing in terms of research. I want to share some perspectives of the, the group that wrote the paper and that relates to our both management and um, in breeding. And we, uh, we address that through two questions. First, why adoption is so low, even though we're we, some, of, uh, some of those varieties, most of those varieties release are, uh, we release are proven to be better. And second, what should be the focus of breeding, forage breeding and management moving forward? And how does us in extension fit into this, into this scenario? So it's kind of aggravating that despite the proven benefits, adoption is still low, so where are we making a mistake? And I risk to say that this is valid also for annual forages and cool season perennials in other regions. Lack of persistence data under adverse conditions is one of the challenges, is one of the main things, releasing materials that have not been tested under the farmer's condition. Need to increase um, use of improved cultivar frequently come with a need for more inputs, and sometimes if we're, not, if we're not able to increase those inputs or change that management, we are not going to see a lot of difference in those improved materials versus the old. And this is an example of, Bermuda, of Bahia grass without nitrogen fertilization, and there is just a slight difference here, just early season because we fertilize early season, and then there is no difference between the older materials and the improved cultivars. That's why we really need those local variety trials because we need to test them at the farmer's condition and also teach them how to use. Availability of planting material, make sure that we can supply the materials that we're releasing. And still, many farmers are going to opt for the low input system. That leads to, me, me to, the, uh, to, leads to the question, if those, those practices are not going to change, should those improved cultivars be recommended because then when they fail is the cultivar's fault and then we have a negative image on that cultivar because it failed because of a management practice and then as an extension specialist people will look at me like that's not that's not good so persistent still probably the most important but also following what dr blunt mentioned resilience under weather conditions might be one of the things that, in, that we need to be looking for in different management practice, not only in the optimum, but what are our farmers really doing. I think diversity is one of the main things we need to be looking at when putting the systems, diverse systems in forage, in time and space. And finally, have those regionalized variety trials as we, uh, continue with those regionalized variety trials to show the importance and also adapt our recommendation practice and help the farmers adapt, adopt, and also adapt their management practices to, be to make sure to enhance the chances of success of those new varieties. And with that, I would just like to thank you for your patience and uh, attention and also the research team that put this together. Thank you. We have time for questions. Any questions? As a new tenure track faculty, um, and you mentioned this at the beginning of your presentation that 
this stuff is very important, but not always at the academic level seen as important for career development. How do you balance trying to get what producer needs and what your own career needs are with variety trials? Well, hindsight is perfect, right? Because when I started, I committed the same, uh, that, that same mistake for the first two years as a new faculty. I was producer need, producer need, variety trial demo. Then two years in, I didn't have a publication, which was very bad for, my, for the beginning of my career. The neat thing, however, is that we've been doing this for so long, for such a long time. For example, Dr. Blunt has so much, so much data that she doesn't even know what to do with it. So as a new faculty, if I could go back in time, I would probably dig into those variety trials, learn more, because that's also important for me as a new faculty, learn from those results, get some data out of there. Because yeah, a lot of what we do is very practical and are not going to, to be able to target high-end journals and we need to be content with uh, applied, applied journals. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Chris Deutsch uh, with University of Kentucky. And Chris is the Extension 4 Specialist located at the uh, United, uh, United, University of Kentucky Research Extension Education Center in Princeton, Kentucky. Chris. Thank you, Rocky. And uh, I believe I could finish my talk in the shortened time period if I could talk as fast as Jennifer Tucker. But, but I don't think I'm going to make it. So make sure and stand up with a few minutes left, Rocky. So uh, the topic that I was asked to speak on was cool season perennials and um, stability in year-round forage production systems. And a couple things I want to go over today. And uh, the first thing I want to mention is long-term shifts in climate normals and then talk a little bit about the history and give you an overview of the forage testing program, which is fairly extensive at the University of Kentucky. Just mention some, some selection criteria for forage species and varieties, which will be more of a review for you all than, than new information. And then talk about choosing resilient varieties for, for this changing climate that we're facing. And then talk about protocols to enhance varietal separation in variety testing. A lot of times when we look at variety test data, things are pretty tight in the variety testing data and we need to do things that help separate those varieties out. So this is just um, a uh, map that shows the annual mean temperature change over the last 10, 10 year period. And we're seeing increases across the United States and a significant increase in this last uh, two 10 year this last 10 year period of about a, a degree. And that's going to impact what's adapted where in terms of species and also the adaptation of varieties. So generally we're going to see varieties that we've seen in the south moving northward. Also looking at annual mean precipitation, if we look at the eastern United States, we're going to see an increase in annual mean precipitation and a decrease in the western United States, which can have an impact on what species and varieties are adapted where. And this was kind of an interesting one that I threw, and this is projected shifts in plant uh, USDA plant hardiness zones. And as we move forward, we're going to see a shift in those zones northward. And that means things that are adapted maybe in Tennessee now are going to be adapted in northern Kentucky in, in the next few decades. So we need to be thinking about that. We need to be testing varieties so that we can find the most resilient varieties as these shifts occur in our climate. So just a little bit about the forage testing program at the University of Kentucky. Um, we've been testing varieties for over 100 years at the University of Kentucky. We formalized the variety testing program in the 1990s. Prior to that, we were testing varieties as part of a very robust and resilient um, forage breeding programs at the University of Kentucky. In uh, 1994, we added a grazing tolerance to our variety testing program, first with cattle and then followed by horses. And these are some of the species that we routinely evaluate um, in terms of cool season grasses, uh, tall fescue, orchard grass, bluegrass. We've got some cool season legumes, alfalfa, red clover, white clover. And then winter and summer annuals are also routinely tested. And then other species are added time to time when there's a need for information. Um, last year, in 2022, we harvested over 5,000 plots um, in our variety testing program. 
And then we report the data annually in a variety of testing bulletins. And then that data is summarized in what we call a long-term summaries uh, that are updated annually. This information can be found on our UK Forages webpage. If you'd like to look at it, just Google UK Y Forages. It'll be the first thing that pops up. And then click on the variety testing icon, and that'll bring you to this page. And um, on this page, what, what you see here is um, we'll have all the reports from the previous year here. And the, probably the most important one that we send producers to would be the long-term summary of Kentucky Forage Variety Trials. And we'll show you that in a minute. Um, if you're interested in previous data, all the data is archived under our, our uh, Variety Testing Reports archive. So this is kind of what the, um, this is what the 2022 long-term uh, summary of Kentucky Forage Variety Trials looks like. Uh, you'll see here a list of tables, and each table is a different species, and it summarizes uh, yield data and, and persistence under grazing data over um, a long period. And this is what one of those tables looks like. I know you can't read this, but, but what I wanted to show you was um, this last column. So, so we have each year, this is the year of the variety trial, this is how many years of data are in the variety trial. And then this last column is kind of a summary of all the years that we had data. If it's blank, there was no, that variety was not entered in that particular year in trial. So when we look at this data, we'll have two numbers here. And this is expressed as a percentage of the mean of commercial varieties in the trial. So a 92 would mean that it's performing lower than the average variety in the, in the uh, trial. And the two means that there was two testing locations for this particular variety. Now, we like to see people use um, this information with at least three uh, testing locations. This is 107, so that means it's performing a little bit above average. And we had 21 testing locations, so we have really good faith in that data in terms of its uh, long-term performance in Kentucky. So I want to talk just a little bit about selecting species and varieties. Um, number one on my list is regional adaptation, which, which could be moving a little bit as the climate shifts and normals change. But, but overall, you have to have a variety that's going to be adapted to where you're trying to grow it at. And then local adaptation. Just because alfalfa is adapted well in Kentucky doesn't mean it's adapted to every soil that I have on my farm. So we need to make sure that where we're trying to grow it locally, that it's well adapted. And then productivity, and we can't understate the importance of yield. Um, we have to have varieties that have maybe not the top yield, but have a decent yield potential. And then distribution of growth. Are we getting that growth early in spring, or is it a nice um, even growth from early spring to early summer um, is an important character, an important thing to uh, remember. Palatability, we want something that the animals are going to consume readily. Good nutritive value, but, but probably not on the top of the list in terms of selecting uh, species. Anti-quality factors like the end of fight. Tolerance to stresses are becoming more and more important. And we've heard that mentioned multiple times today. Um, for things all the way from hypoxia to drought stress um, to grazing tolerance are all important uh, to consider. And all that kind of comes together under persistence. We've got to have varieties that, that are persistent within the system. When we look at the two probably that are, are at the top of my list in terms of selecting varieties, we want them to be productive and we want them to be persistent. And that persistence is really important in perennial forage systems. So how, how do we evaluate that? Well, what, what I did was I took the long-term variety testing data and I went back and looked through that and we graphed out on our x-axis the yield and 100 represents the average yield for the trial, so we can rank all of our varieties above average for yield or below average for yield. And we did the same thing with persistence under grazing. So we took all the varieties, and this happens to be for orchard grass variety trials. 100 would be the average persistence, and below that would be below average persistence, above, above average persistence. And that allows us to divide this graph into four quadrants. In these varieties down here in the lower left-hand quadrant, 
have below average yield and below average persistence. Those are probably varieties that we don't want to include in a, in a year-round forage program. The ones that we really want to focus on are these varieties in the upper right-hand quadrant. They have above average yield and above average persistence. Those are probably varieties that we should take a second look at and um, think about including into, in uh, forage systems. I also did this for alfalfa, and the results were a little bit different, and we're going to talk about why that is in a minute, but essentially um, we didn't have any varieties that were up in the upper right-hand quadrant. And, and that's a little concerning, and we'll talk about why that happened, but it has to do with not getting uh, separation for persistence, even under our grazing trials. So in order to use a system like this, we have to have two pieces of data, right? We have to have the yield performance under clipping, and then we have to have persistence under grazing uh, to make this work. And it requires that we get varietal separation. So most of the varieties that we put in, that seed companies put in trials are gonna perform fairly well for yield, right? So we're not gonna have a tremendous range in yield. And, um, and persistence could be the same, but, but really we've gotta figure out a way to get that separation. If we look at, at the data for the orchard grass, this is the same diagram as before. We had about a 10% range in yield for, um, for yield, and then a 40% range in persistence. So we got nice separation for persistence under grazing with our, our current grazing trials. If we look at the same, same graph for alfalfa, we did not get that separation for persistence. So even though we were grazing, evaluating these varieties under grazing, we only had a 4% range in differences in persistence. And that's not enough to separate varieties out. We've got to think about what we can do to, to help enhance that varietal separations for persistence, which is an especially important trait for perennial forage systems. And, and this is really kind of a testament to how well adapted tall fescue is in the northern transition zone and its, its durability under grazing. So the question becomes, uh, how do we impose more stress on, on those varieties to get that separation? So we can do several things. We can extend the grazing period. So currently in our variety testing program, we'll stock them in the spring when they're ready to stock and we'll take animals off in the fall. A better approach may be to leave animals on year round to put more stress on those varieties. So every time they're growing a little bit, the animal's right there to clip that, that growth off and, and that may give us better varietal separation for persistence. Maybe we need to evaluate them under low fertility conditions. I know that kind of goes against our, our grain as agronomist, but on many farms in the southeastern United States, fertility is not ideal. In fact, on probably most farms, fertility is not ideal. And maybe we need to be selecting those varieties under lower fertility conditions to impose greater stress. Thinking about the geographic location where we're testing them, so we do our grazing evaluation in Lexington. We probably should be doing it in western Kentucky where the conditions are harsher. And, and maybe even further south, you know. And this gets back to what Marcello and Ann were talking about. We need really regional collaborations for variety evaluation in the southeastern United States. And if we can take these tall fescue varieties, maybe do clipping trials in Kentucky and maybe go to Arkansas and or northern Mississippi and do uh, persistence under grazing, we could get a better data set that shows better varietal separation for persistence and yield. And the last thing we can do is, is think about using accelerated stand loss protocols. And this isn't new. Uh, Bouton and co-workers did this with the uh, development of novel endophyte tall fescue varieties in the 1990s. And um, essentially what they did was they planted tall fescue into a Bermuda grass sod and put it under tremendous grazing stress to get varietal separation. We probably really need to think about taking some approach like that to get this separation for persistence. So in, in summary, you know, we're seeing changes in long-term weather patterns. Whether they're man-induced or not, I don't know. I'm not a climatologist, but I, I know it's getting warmer and I know that I'm seeing more warm season grasses encroach into cool season pastures in Kentucky. And that's likely going to impact the species that are adapted here and also the, how well the varieties are adapted. 
So improving yield stability will require selecting resilient varieties that are better adapted to these shifting weather, weather patterns as we move forward. And varieties are going to have to be evaluated not just for yield, but also for persistence as we move forward. And that's going to cost more, and it's going to be more work. But in order to choose those varieties that are going to do well in grazing situ uh, situations on farms in this region of the country, we really need to have that data. And then, again, regional collaborations, I think, are going to be key as we move forward. I know that's a, a difficult sell sometimes, but the more we work together on variety evaluation, the better data set that we can put together to benefit all of us in the southeastern United States. And then consider using accelerated stand loss protocols for persistence evaluation of cool season species. And I'd just like to finish up, and, and Ray, Ray Smith and Jimmy Henning and I kind of take the credit for the variety testing program in Kentucky, but it's really these two guys that are doing it, Gene Olson and, and Gene's in Lexington, and he runs the variety testing program, and then Brittany Hendricks is with me in uh, Western Kentucky, and um, she handles all the variety testing at, in the Western Kentucky location. So we really appreciate them and uh, want to thank them for their uh, contributions to the variety testing program. And with that, I've got time for a question. Ann? <laughs> so, so we charge for for um, we charge for uh, all varieties that are entered as commercial varieties, of course, in the program, and then companies will enter experimentals, and they have to pay for those. I'm not sure about Tim Phillips' program, whether he's, we're charging him, but I kind of doubt whether we're charging him to evaluate varieties. Do you solicit from other state breeders for the trial in Florida system and then experimental materials from a Do you have a checkbook? Do you have a checkbook? <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure we could include some varieties from, from the Florida program in, in there. So, but I, I really do think we need to be looking at a regional approach to variety testing in the southeastern United States. I know a lot of us don't know, but we used to have regional forest testing in this country. But we don't have it now. Remember the USDA went there when I started, and I'm retired now. We could get regional trials from So when I was in Virginia and we were testing uh, in your ryegrass varieties, we always would get several varieties from the University of Florida to include in our test. And we didn't charge for those. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and then uh, close the session with the, uh, my last talk here really quick and uh, um, talk about a little bit about you guys seen a large array of four systems that can be incorporated across the southern United States into what we call the transition sun. And one thing that I'm going to talk about a little bit here is about the use of some of these warm season grasses as well that we can use as what we call a pinpoint grazing system. And when I talked about pinpoint grazing system, what I'm defining that is that is basically a system composed of annual warm season grasses that can supply a cost effective solution to seasonal phase supplementation challenge. Uh, Marcelo talks about some of the our perennial warm season grasses, and one of the things that usually we see with those is that they need to be much lower in nutritive value. And sometimes in the southern United States, we have producers that are winning the calf, want to keep some of those calf into the summer uh, for a better market, but also trying to keep some of those calves that they can transition in the fall and put into annual ryegrass and then finish them going to the field lot or s by retaining their ownership or selling them. So it gives you an opportunity to actually have more flexibility in that system. So like I mentioned, one of the problems we have when season perennial grasses, uh, Bermuda grass and Bahia grass tend to be lower in nutritive value. So at this point, grazing system can allow that flexibility in there as well. So 
when we look at the, the array of these grasses, what you see here, the first three will be our warm season perennial grasses. They tend to be very, act, very I think a little bit more better nutritive value from early May to uh, late July, depending on where you're at. And then, even though because they are warm season perennial grass, it doesn't mean that they don't suffer in that heat, especially heat humidity in the south. We can see that Bahia grass and Bermuda grass can get stunted. So this four system here, crabgrass, four sorghum permillate and sorghum sudan hybrids, can actually help those farmers to have that flexibility in there. I'm a big fan of crabgrass because of the reason that once you plant it, it can actually recede very well into the system every year. We don't see that flexibility when we use a, a forest sorghum, a permanent or sorghum sudan. They tend to be more short season. Usually, depending on where you are in the south, might range from only 90 to 70 to 90 days of grazing. So our, our, our summer is usually about six months. So you have another three months in there that you have to look at how I can supplement that. Even though the summer annuals also can uh, fill that void when you have a field that you're rotating from a prepared seed or annual ryegrass into an annual crop and maintain that rotation as well. So just to give you an idea, this is some of the uh, uh, long-term data that we have collected at Mississippi State looking at some of how they compare. Uh, on your left, you have all the warm season perennial grasses. You have Bahia grass in there, uh, Bermuda, hybrid Bermuda grass, the seed Bermuda grass, and then Dallas grass. Dallas grass, is, there's not a seed availability out there. I think it's a, it's a great forage as a perennial warm season grass, but because of the issues they have with seed production and, and seed germination, we don't have any accessions or varieties that are commercially available. So it really limits the utilization. So, and then you see there where crabgrass uh, productivity and some of the four sorghum millet uh, fit into that system as well. Uh, one of the issues that we see with this, some, uh, especially the sorghum sudan and sudan grass and, and four sorghum, uh, one major problem that we face in the south now is the sugarcane aphids. We see that when we plant the summer annuals, we can have a lot of damage uh, from the sugarcane aphid and productivity and yield on the, in, this, in this type of situations. And, and the sugarcane aphid, basically what it does is, is basically that aphid is underneath the, the leaves, it starts sucking up the, um, the, um, the honeydew, making that leaves more sticky, shiny, and then start to dry. So you lose, start to lose productivity. Uh, so it could be also temperature dependent. We see that the sugarcane aphids, it, the later you plant into summer, some of the summer annuals, the more damage you may see that if you plant in mid-May to early, early June. Um, one thing that we have noticed, and we've done some work at this at Mississippi State, uh, so a couple of varieties within uh, those groups and, and look at how the uh, damage from sugarcane aphids is, is, is rated, and you see here that uh, with forest sorghum, we can get up close to 50% damage per millet, and I'll talk about that, half an asterisk in there, and we'll talk about the yellow mosaic virus damage in there. But the per millet tend to be very resistant to sugarcane aphids. So from that point of view, advantage probably in leafy material, you have less also um, trampling from the grazing point of view because it's not so tall uh, as the uh, forest sorghum or sorghum sudan grass. But you can see that also that some of the uh, sorghum sudan and sudan grasses can have a lot of damage. Talking about per millet, what we see is that the per millet tend to be very resistant. But one of the problems that we have is that sometimes the sugarcane aphids can also be a, a vector uh, for uh, the uh, uh, maize dwarf mosaic virus in permanently. And what it does is can cause a lot of damage. And what this is what we usually observe here is, um, is this yellow. Looks like it's nitrogen deficient, but it's not. You see this yellow streaks caused by the virus. So we can actually see some, some impact, secondary impact from that. And sometimes if you had Johnson grass in some of those adjacent fields, Johnson grass and some of the aphids in the Johnson grass could be a vector that can transmit into that system as well. So we started last year a study uh, evaluating uh, quite a bit of the uh, varieties that are in the market. Uh, we have 30 varieties. Uh, Josh and I are working on this, evaluating this, evaluating this variety for sugarcane aphids. So uh, lucky last year we don't have a lot of high infestation in the field. So, so you have those variability all the time. So what you see here is that uh, there was very little damage. We, we rank it from one to be in, 
no damage to Tim being very severe damage. Most of these varieties actually were in the, uh, in the twos and threes. So not a lot of aphids infestation that we saw in there to see uh, a lot of differences. And one of the things that we, we're going to repeat this year and hopefully a couple more years is that the new varieties in the marking uh, called, they have a aphid X gene that's supposed to be more resistant to sugarcane aphids. Uh, uh, there's a couple of companies that are looking into that. So we wanna see actually if there is a, a, a advantage of those varieties uh, compared to conventional varieties that we usually recommend in the South. The other thing that we have is that we do uh, use this crab uh, these pinpoint grazing systems uh, quite a bit also uh, and to guide producers on grazing management. So he, what you see here is a study that we had done looking at how uh, this grazing system might integrate into uh, our summer growing season. And what we did in this, we have three crabgrasses. We have impact, quick and big spreader, and Red River crabgrass and we have a per millet that is a BMR, and we're comparing how their productivity compares uh, for about 90 days compared to bahia grass as you try to supplement that as a pinpoint grazing system. And what we have found is that when we look at uh, the nutritive value of those systems compared to bahia grass, you will see that they have a, um, they have a higher uh, protein content compared to bahia grass. They were fertilized the same way, we, with the same amount of nitrogen, so there was no different fertilization, but we wanted to see how they produce. So you see that you have much higher crude protein in those pinpoint grazing system compared to bahia grass, lower fiber content, and a little bit higher digestibility to bahia grass. With that, what we see is that when it comes to um, uh, average daily gains, we see here that um, um, bahia grass and, and a two-year study was about 0.6 uh, pounds per, per head per day, while uh, some of the crabgrasses uh, with Red River, we're getting about 1.4. So from the point of view of providing a better supplementation for those calves that are being weaned and developed, this might be an option uh, for those producers. Uh, when we look at also at the uh, game per acre, we see uh, that our game per acres are, can, are very well justifiable. You only got about 30 pounds of game per acre, uh, pounds per acre, well, with the Red River crabgrass, we average about 122, and the permalate is about 93. So the economics of return, I think, uh, for precondition pre of those calf might have some advantage in there. Uh, another thing that we are doing is uh, looking at uh, how can we utilize these grasses as a pinpoint grazing system. And this is something that we see quite a bit with producers in the south that, well, I want to introduce a bahia grass or vermilion grass, but I don't want to lose the grazing potential for the whole summer. So this is some of the work that we've done was looking at how can we integrate uh, vermilion grass or bahia grass into uh, a summer, what is summer annual. You have a monoculture here, bahia grass, but also we in incorporate with four sorghum permillate or sorghum sudan in the same thing for vermilion grass. We use different seeding rates here going all the way from 10 to 15, 20 pounds of the uh, uh, pinpoint grazing system with 20 pounds of bahia grass or 10 pounds of vermilion grass. And the seeding rates of those did not affect the establishment. So you can see here in this picture where you have that bahia grass getting established underneath that system, and either you can cut it out for hay or you can graze it in an open that canopy. So it allows you to actually recover some of the uh, grazing potential through that summer. Um, another thing is you can see here is we do look at also how does BMR system uh, forage might fit into what we do in the south. Uh, there is a lot of uh, new BMR brown, brown mirror, uh, uh species, high good digestibility being incorporated into that. And, and so we have looked at some of those and assisting compared to uh, Green Grazer 5, which is a, a conventional um, sorghum sudan grass, and, and looking at the productivity and, and grazing system. And what we see is that um, we might have higher average daily gains with some of the BMRs, but still the Green Grazer 5 have a longer productivity and is giving us a, a longer production per acre compared to some of those BMRs. So we haven't seen a lot of uh, benefit of those systems in there. Another thing that we're doing, and this is something that you know, Marcelo mentioned brachiaries earlier, uh, and, and we're not using it as a perennial. You know, I think uh, while looking at it as a pinpoint grazing system as an annual. Why? Because I mentioned earlier that we have that 70 to 90 days of grazing with the traditional summer annuals, and then what? 
And what we're doing here, uh, I had a grad student with this work, we see that these brachiaris have high biomass. We evaluated several in the last two years, so we're gonna evaluate a large number of those this year and actually do an aggression study as well. And one of the things that we have found is that uh, we tested the germination in the field and see, try to determine what is the uh, germination window of this bracaria. And in Mississippi conditions, we found that it takes about 25 to 30 days for a good germination. So what we're doing is we went and put uh, our traditional sorghum, Suzanne, for sorghum or millet, inclu included with the bracaria. And those bracaria have been planted at 10 pounds per acre. And then, so by the time that the bracaria has started to germinate, we're ready to graze or harvest our traditional summer annuals and then open in that canopy. So when we did that system in the simulated grazing, what we see is that about uh, the second grazing is about 70% brachiarias and about 30% of the traditional uh, warm season grasses. And those brachiarias carry productivity all the way until we got frost and they got killed by that. But one of the things that we, I think we have a lot of advantages, even though we're using it as a summer annual, we see that this Brachiaries are developing a very robust root system. So from the point of view of soil health, I'm looking mainly at soil retention, uh, less uh, runoff erosions. Uh, I think we might have something that might be beneficial in there. And then I think that we want to explore as well, can we plant annual ryegrass into the brachiaries after they are gone um, dormant through uh, frost? And is there any allelopathic effect between the ryegrass and the brachiaries? We don't know yet. So the, there's a lot of things that we need to explore in that system. Just to give you an idea, here's some of the preliminary data that we collected when we integrated the brachiaria by itself, or you have an incorporate, or for, you had a four sorghum, or you have a combination of the two, the same thing with the permillet. Uh, or a sorghum sedan, and then we have a combination of the forest sorghum, sorghum, uh, permeable sorghum sedan to look at what kind of productivity we have in those systems. And what we see is that when we incorporate the permeable with the brachiaria or the uh, sorghum sedan with the brachiaria, we see that increase in yield compared to their counterparts as a monoculture. So I think that there's an opportunity to really extend that grazing season and provide those, those animals with a better, longer growing, uh, extended grazing season and probably better animal performance. So we're gonna start doing those grazing studies this year and, and be able to have some data to, to present hopefully next year. So to summarize, you know, one thing that we had to look at that people in grazing season can increase grazing efficiency by providing uh, forage with great, greater nutritive value compared to our traditional warm season uh, perennials. Uh, we are going to have to look at high intensity, short duration grazing uh, in midsummer. Uh, that's something that could uh, benefit the uh, stocky cattle in the southern U.S. Uh, they allows also to precondition cattle for retaining for winter grazing and annual ryegrass. But we also need to have more long-term data and, uh, to determine the economic return and the benefits of the extent of this extended integrated system, especially with the brachiaria. This city is it's not cheap, so we need to look at the cost of gain and what might be the economic return that we have in those systems. So that's all I have, and I don't know if anybody has any questions. <laughs> Leanne? So in the Southeast US, uh, one thing I struggle with is I am, think these are amazing systems, but when I talk to producers, what percentage of, your far, of their farms do you think they should have put in an annual rotation? I, when I look at those systems, I mostly producers I work with, they might put in about 20, 25% into that system. Uh, just to allow them to have a better for you, it depending also what their long-term goals. And that's one of the things that I usually ask them, you know, when you're calving season is, when are you planning to, to, to win those calf? Are you planning to retain those calf? And so then we, we make those recommendations based on that and see what fits. You know, we can also incorporate some legumes in this system. Cowpea probably is one of the best that we can use. Cowpea works wonderful in that system. So forest soybeans do, but you know, the, the economic expense of forest soybeans because it's used in a, in a, in a wildlife setting is much higher. So it's very hard for a producer to justify that cost. We have been looking at other legumes like sesbania and 
uh, Alice Clover and see how we can integrate in those. I wish we can use some hemp in Mississippi, we cannot. It's considered noxious weed in, in the state of Mississippi, so we don't have the opportunity to integrate that into the system. With that said, hopefully we're gonna have some data here. We got some uh, special restricted use of some hemp just to do some research in Mississippi and see if we can actually allow it to be used as a grazing opportunity for cattle producers in Mississippi. I know. <laughs> Any other questions? R Rocky, when um, I just had a graduate student finish, and she did two chapters on the economics of summer annuals, and yeah. when I read them, I cried because they were so bad. And uh, I'm I'm not sure how to work summer annuals in. I mean, I love summer annuals, and I I think they can work for this kind of pinpoint mm -hmm. thing, but they are pretty expensive, and. Uh, I've gotten to the point where I tell people, you know, um, a good place to work summer annuals in would be when you're trying to renovate a pasture. I mean, that is kind of a place that kind of makes sense. I got a weak, cool season pasture. I want to renovate it. I spray it out. I put a summer annual in, and then I reestablish it in the fall. Yeah, and we have used that quite a bit, you know, with the Bermuda grass and Bahia grass system. Uh, it works very well to allow to decrease the loss of um, potential, grazing potential in those systems. And I agree with you. I think that, you know, we looking at when, I think the, the main thing you have to be is with timing of also the warm season annuals. You know, the, the earlier you plant it, probably the, the better productivity you have, the, probably the better return. If you're trying to plant those very late in the season, July, August, your opportunity of utilization really goes down. I got to produce in South Mississippi because in South Mississippi we got a longer growing season. He's planted in late August and it's using as a, as a grazing system where he grazed it and then introduced the ryegrass and he get a regrowth and he grazed it again and then pull the animals out and the ryegrass start to get established. So there are some opportunities that I think I might serve in that, in that, in that system. We're using 20 pounds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you. I think some of the economics sometimes cannot be justifiable. And that's what we are trying to find with all this data that we have. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you for attending, and uh, hopefully you guys got some good information out of this. For those that are participating in the Southern Pasture group, uh, there's a meeting in room five coming up. 530.